Hello, and welcome to The Money Movement, a show where we explore the issues and ideas driving this brave new world of digital currency and blockchains. Uh, global stable coins, such as Center Consortium's US dollar coin, uh, Libra Association's new family of stable coins are on the rise, giving way to coordinated regulatory responses for these innovative new forms of digital money and payment systems. You know, at the same time, governments and large financial industry actors are examining what digital currencies backed by central bank money might bring in terms of new opportunities and risks. All of this increasing is, is increasing the attention on governance models. How should global stable coins be governed? How can standards be established that work across these leading stable coin arrangements? but also contemplate and support government-sponsored and led digital currency projects. What's the role of the public sector versus the private sector? All of these are questions that we're thinking about uh, in this realm of governance. And, and in particular, how can we learn from the lessons of the past 30 years in the development of internet standards, open source software, decentralized internet infrastructure, all building blocks that digital currency is taking advantage of and that these new kinds of, of systems and schemes are building on as well. And so as the internet collides with money and the financial system, governance models are really starting to take center stage. So to discuss all of these issues and more, I'm really thrilled to welcome our guests this week. Uh, first, Sheila Warren, who's head of blockchain and data policy and a member of the executive committee for the World Economic Forum, where she has spearheaded the formation of a global consortium for digital currency governance, and Dante Disparte, uh, the vice chairman and head of policy and communications for Libra Association, uh, an emerging global stablecoin arrangement with broad industry backing, uh, where uh, I'm also here as uh, Circle CEO, I'm also here as co-founder and director of Center Consortium, which is a, an emerging governance framework for global stablecoins, including the USDC standard. And uh, we are uh, welcoming uh, Sheila and Dante to join us right now. Hey, Dante. Hey, Jeremy, good to see you. Good to see you as well. Um, and uh, hello, Sheila. Hi there. Excellent. Awesome to have you guys on today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, ab absolutely. Why don't we start with something um, you know really basic? I think for for each of you, Sheila, maybe you could start. Um, what is this new global consortium for the governance of digital currency that that you have uh, you know helped to spearhead at the World Economic Forum? Could you just maybe just start to talk a little bit about that that agenda and and what you're trying to accomplish? Sure, my pleasure. So as many know, we issued a CBDC policymakers toolkit at Davos this past January, and that reflected 18 months of community building in the CBDC space with central bank technologists and was the response to a demand signal from them that we create a toolkit for policymakers to understand the trade-offs and considerations in the issues of the CBDC. So the Digital Currency Governance Consortium is the next phase of that work, if you will. Our idea was always to start with CBDCs. They were um, more palatable, shall we say, to the Davos crew, our community. We thought there was so much innovation happening there already, and there was need of a more uh, objective guide to uh, that particular kind of offering. So with, DC, with the DCGC, as we call it, Digital Currency Governance Consortium, it's aiming to do the same thing with stable coins. So key things to note, there will be no coin issuance. This is not a consortium in the way that we think about it, like we were at the Association or Center uh, or others that exist in the space. Uh, we are simply here to look at policy aspects specifically and governance aspects around the issuance of digital currency, stable coin. And what we're trying to do is identify where are their themes, where are their gaps, uh, and where are their trade-offs that we can help elucidate using kind of the forums history of objectivity neutrality to articulate what those distinctions might look like. It's awesome. And uh, I, I think uh, uh, an extremely important project, obviously. And, and um, you know, thank you for that, for that introduction. Um, Dante, maybe uh, similarly, uh, the in a nutshell, what is the Libra Association? What role does it play in governance around Libra? And uh, just, you know, a, a quick description there for folks. 
Sure. So, so the Libra Association is now a year old um, effort that is also a consortium driven effort um, today comprised of 27 member organizations that are building a blockchain based payment system um, and the supporting stablecoin infrastructure to be able to create um, the infrastructure necessary for digital money to exist, but also to facilitate lower cost payments at global scale. Excellent. That's awesome. And I'll just sort of Briefly also share, so uh, I, I'm also a director of Center Consortium. Center Consortium has, uh, has been around for now a, a couple of years and uh, you know, Circle and Coinbase both were members of that and um, it governs the US dollar coin standard and there's a, you know, an ecosystem of now uh, a, a few hundred companies that are involved in supporting and implementing that in different ways. Um, and, uh, and I think we're also, you know, you know, thinking about, okay, now as this moves into the realm of government oversight, as this moves into the realm of, you know, major existing financial industry stakeholders figuring out what's their role in this. This isn't just crypto startups anymore. This is moving into a very different kind of tier. I think all of us are kind of collectively thinking about what are those, those global governance models and how, how are those going to scale uh, to support this opportunity? I guess um, I, I think uh, governance as a concept, uh, means a lot of different things to a, a, a lot of different people. Uh, you know, uh, you know, so, sometimes governance, people think that literally means like government, like the government, what's the government going to do? Uh, you know, obviously there's this long history of governance in technology uh, on the internet, governance of standards, governance of, um, you know, uh, of, uh, you know, uh, financial networks. Um, I, you know, what is, with this digital currency, global digital currency, what does governance, what does good governance mean? What is that going to look like? I'm happy to, to take a stab at that. Yeah. Dante and I have a pact to not talk over each other, but it does mean we're going to be like, is it you or me? I can't promise I'll keep it though. <laughs> I know, I'm going to try, I'm going to try. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, you know, for me, I think, for us at the forum rather, I should say, governance is a couple of different things. So one, it's kind of the enabling infrastructure that surrounds any particular issuance. So it is the regulatory framework. It is to some extent government policies. You know, it is almost a cultural... Uh, understanding the money, what money is, like all those kinds of things we think make up the broader governance environment, the enabling environment. But it's also the rules of a specific game. So any particular issuance is going to have, or any particular consortium or whatever it might be, is going to have its own rules, its own, its own operating model. And all of that makes up the governance as well. So we kind of think about it as almost internal governance and external governance. And both those things need to operate in consonant. And part of what's really interesting is I think in the early, early days, like the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin only, you know, kinds of days, there was this reaction to the external governance, if you will. It was very, very reactive, right? And so the internal governance was a, a key area of focus, but that interaction between these two different layers wasn't something that was given a tremendous amount of attention, even yeah. though it was obviously thought about, right? So what we're trying to do is draw those connections. Uh, mm -hmm. with the work that we're doing. But I think all of these things are, are really important. Yeah, and, and if I could just build on that, I, I think the, you know, all too often big technology efforts, including the early, early movements um, in digital currency, uh, tended to be projects that would ask for um, forgiveness rather than permission. And then we've learned the hard way over the last 11 years that it's a very, very complicated model. And it often then means that, you know, these innovations are are framed in opposition to existing systems. And especially when you're talking about money and finance, being in opposition to a regulatory regime or a compliance regime is one, not great for longevity. And two, it's not really great in, in the public interest. We have to remember that a lot of these external factors that uh, much of the early wave of the digital currency movement was railing against or candidly might've been even designed to avoid altogether um, a lot of those regimes around the world are, are established in response to whether it's market failures and crashes and the rest as a response of, and a reflection of public interest. So I do think it's vitally important that the governance movement today, and I'm encouraged by the work that she is leading at the WEF um, to help try to build a consortium here, is that the more we could harmonize these interests, the more we will learn that there's actually not a ton of conflict between um, a stable coin project that is trying to get regulated and, and what is ultimately the type of public interest that we now see. And, and in this type of crisis, you could see exact, very big, bright spot areas where, um, where those interests are now starting to converge. Um, whether it's a government-backed digital currency or private sector initiatives, you're starting to see a lot of alignment here.
Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I, when I think about this a little bit, it's sort of like, and, and, and some of what you shared, Sheila, also made me think of this as sort of these layers of governance, right? You've got like, you know, the Internet Engineering Task Force governs TCP IP, right? Okay, well, who's that? I mean, it's this international organization, it's a bunch of IP, a bunch of academics, it's sort of out there. Uh, and, and then, you know, you have these other things like, okay, you have uh, a blockchain, it's like an operating system and it's an open source project. And well, how's that governed? Well, it's sort of informally, there's a community of people and sort of people get kind of power to approve pull requests. And, you know, uh, and then there's sort of, you know, the, the, you know, the governance of who validates transactions. And then there's a governance of a protocol on top of it. And then there's a governance of what laws apply to the use of that protocol. And then there's the government, it's just layers and layers of governance. And um, I think uh, a lot of times when people think about digital currency or global digital currency, I, I think they, they want to think of it as like just, you know, this one vertically integrated stack that is, you know, that you can govern. But what we're, we're all we're doing is we're, we're, we're building on all of these, you know, very diverse systems of governance that we can compound value from. And, and I think it's, I think now these, the kind of work that the WEF is doing and consortium and others are doing is, is, um, is really trying to bring that all the way up to this, the world leader stage and bring that all the way up to, you know, like how do we as a planet organize ourselves around this particular technical breakthrough? Um, and uh, so it's, it's interesting. Um, maybe, you know, g given the focus on sort of global stable coins or sort of the, you know, stable coins that have really, you know, really broad reach, um, there's obviously the, 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 this is a, principally a private sector uh, phenomenon uh, t today. Um, you know, w when you, when, you know, Sheila, when you think about uh, the, that interplay between, you know, public policy, the financial market infrastructure slash financial industry, and then the, these new arrangements that are out there, you know, what are the, you know, w what would you hope to see out of the governance work that, that you're doing um, to address the, the rise of stable coins? Yeah, so, you know, we have the, the luxury uh, of not uh, being wedded to any particular modality or any particular offering, any particular issuance. And so um, what we're hoping to surface, you know, are, are the tensions and trade-offs, which we think are inevitable. We do think, I think that there is room for different kinds of CBDC issuances, different kinds of stablecoin issuances with, different, different, with a different basket, you know, behind them. Uh, and crypto, for that matter, pure crypto as well. And I think that there is a role for all of these. I think there is this kind of sixth grade social studies notion, you know, that we kind of start with CBDC and then we graduate, we become more enlightened and we graduate to, you know, stable coin and then we graduate to crypto. And I, I just, that's, I want to blow that out of the water. It doesn't make any sense. Those things are different offerings for different purposes. And so I think, I think to, to kind of Dante's point, we are seeing some convergence in, I, I would almost say like the force ranking of priorities you know, but the reactions to those are different. Certainly, if you are FATF or I, don't, I could just call them out, whatever, there's a lot of other bodies as well, the SEC, if you're a regulator of certain kind, uh, you have a very particular point of view, you know, obviously. Um, and if you are a Bitcoin maximalist, you know, which again, not to pause those as opposites, but to some extent, they kind of are. <laughs> I think we can just own that here. You have a very different point of view, but that's in part because you're focusing on a very different problem and you're focusing on your perceptions of that problem. So part of what I'm, I'm heartened to see is academics turning to articulation of the problem space uh, in addition to kind of the design questions that come up. And we're hoping that as we see more and more of that, we're going to be able to really ground in a common understanding of what the different problems are and what types of offerings are of most value <clears throat> and where those where that value can differ. Mm -hmm. So I, financial inclusion is a great example. Remittances is a great example. Intervict settlements is a great example. You know, they have different requirements. You think you can think of them as different use cases, which they to a large extent are. And how do we articulate the nuance there in a way that can translate into governance and into an underlying governance framework? That I think is the real challenge and where we feel we can play uh, a really strong role because again, we don't have any of those particular use cases as of paramount importance and we're not trying to mm -hmm. in any way assert that, right? That one of them is the priority over another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and if I can add to that as well, uh, Jeremy, the, the, you know, to me, this entire asset class is not as much a breakthrough in technology, but a breakthrough in organizing principles. 
and therefore governance. I mean, like not since the earliest, earliest days of the internet and the era of tech titans have we seen a space so desperately in need of regulatory clarity and alignment with all of these external interests for it to continue to blossom and thrive. I mean, oftentimes people dismiss blockchain efforts and crypto efforts as a race to the bottom and, and that a lot of these projects are looking for, you know, regulatory havens mm -hmm. in different locations. This is not about arbitrage. If we get it right, it's yeah. about empowerment. And, and I, I think Sheila hit on a, a very important point about, you know, in the regulatory domain, they talk about same risks, same rules mm -hmm. or technology neutrality. It tends to be difficult to put into practice, yeah. but from a practical point of view, when you describe then the asset, the tokenized asset or the digital currency, I also think it's important to add another layer to that same risk, same rules model, which is regulate the economic behavior of the digital asset. Don't create a catch-all model where all crypto is bad. Not all stable coins are created equal. Not all CBDCs are created equal. Um, you know, Hank Paulson wrote a great piece recently that said, you know, a, a, a digital version of a currency is nothing less than the sum of all the parts. And so if all the parts are also bad, a digital twin will also be bad. And so the governance breakthrough here will do more for the mainstreaming and the mass adoption and all the good that come of this space than the technological breakthroughs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I see that. I mean, this is like the what is standing in the way. I mean, there are there are technological things that need to happen. There's usability things that need to happen, scalability things that need to happen. We, we, you know, there's various things that are moving along. As a technologist, I, that's all. Those are solvable problems, and I can see that right on the horizon. Uh, it's these governance governance issues that are going to allow a, a person, a business, a government to say, yes, this is the future of the international you know, monetary system and financial system, and and to have the rules of the road and 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 know. Yeah. How risks are managed and so on. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. It's a tremendous opportunity, you know, and, and rather than just digitizing our existing system with all of its flaws, mm. it, it's the flaws that currently exist with all of the um, the dynamics of power and the balance that exists there or doesn't, the imbalance, I should say more accurately, uh, and the exclusion that is inherent to our current system, we have a chance to rethink some of that. And we can rethink that using governance and then we can apply whatever technological layer is going to be mo of most benefit to that. So mm -hmm. I should note also, just because um, I didn't, that we are, we are technically agnostic. So our CBDC policymakers toolkit, you know, does contain discussions of where blockchain is of value and where it might be of less value. And we certainly think that there are and will be uh, explorations of CBDC that have nothing to do with the blockchain that really just leverage more, um, uh, ordinary, let's say, you know, technologies. Uh, and the same thing may wind up being true for certain stablecoin issuances as well. I think that we need to be examining very uh, thoughtfully and holistically, you know, where a technical solution is actually adding value and that value is coming from the new governance model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you know, and, and if I can add again, another sort of general philosophical point here, the, um, you know, in my mind, if we accept the narrative that finance has reached a point of diminishing returns, i.e. a world with 1.7 billion people unbanked, 1.3 billion underbanked, um, the inability for you and I to send value to each other instantaneously as easily as we would send a message or a video or make a phone call, um, that, that perhaps if that is in fact the case, that we can no longer extend the perimeter of the formal economy short of big scale innovation, then these types of innovations aren't necessarily competing with the existing financial system, but perhaps completing it as one sort of thesis. Yep. And we do want to encourage a lot of innovation, a lot of vigorous competition around all of the edges of these ideas. Um, the other piece of the puzzle is, is, you know, the external environment is the rulemaking environment. And so the more bodies like, you know, the World Economic Forum, the Financial Stability Board, and a number of other groups that are starting to coalesce, and on top of which you then have something like 70% of the world's central banks thinking about CBDC or experimenting with it. To me, that's a very encouraging environment. We need to move. Um, this is not something that will, you know, is going to get better with time, the, the, the condition of being ex excluded from the financial system. Um, and it's a source of an enormous amount of risk in the planet. Um, and the pandemic has only just revealed that it's fortress nations, just as much as developing and emerging countries are being plagued by very, very deep sources of financial exclusion. And, yeah. and unless people come up with better fixes faster, uh, these issues aren't going away. Yeah, no, I, I see yeah. that it's, it's uh, these are, uh, it's, it's sort of uh, kind of perfect timing on, on a lot of fronts from that. I wonder, you know, 
um, there's sort of these lessons that we we draw from uh, other phases of innovation in the internet. That's a common theme. There's there's obviously lessons we can draw from, you know, you know, electronic money itself, like the the birth of messaging standards like SWIFT, the the birth of card associations, like the what we think of as electronic money today, whether it's sort of fractional reserve commercial bank money or or or, or central bank money, like all of these, you know led ended up you know kind of happening at scale when broad stakeholders got together to agree upon standards uh to make sure that those standards and how they operate work within the law uh and and that governments be comfortable with them and you know this is sort of as you said dante like this is the next logical stage of the of the international financial system it can it's has the potential to do a lot more and be more inclusive and more efficient and open up you know programmability and all this super exciting stuff but you know fundamentally the thing that gets these things to have scale is is layering 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 and governance i i wonder you know what other lessons we can learn from the growth of the internet itself um, and internet standards and you know i think I remember well, uh, you know, when uh, you know the early stages of commercialization of the internet, and you know, you had regulators in every country in the world, some of whom controlled nat, nat, you know, national monopolies that controlled, say, the communication system of a given country. Uh, some of which had, you know, uh, actual monopolies, uh, you know, uh, but you know, fundamentally, like there was a set of, of governance that emerged around technical standards that was mostly driven by computer scientists, academics, innovators, and then industry sort of said, oh, you know what, this stuff is pretty good. It's good enough. We're going to start connecting to it. And, and then, you know, the, the, the technology raced way ahead of what the regulatory regimes ever had. Like, you know, it used to be if you wanted to like broadcast a, a radio show in Italy, like you needed permission from a regulator to to do that but i can do that i can do that right this minute i can broadcast a radio show in in italy uncensored uh and and so um i wonder what lessons there are to learn um and and whether is there a disconnect between what i'll just call like the the community-led open source grassroots you know, movement of the internet, which is, you know, has built all this stuff and the expectation that governments have about, no, this stuff is stuff that we control. And, and you know, how do we reconcile that? Because um, it, it seems like it, it worked in the world of, of, of information, knowledge, communications, content to be a little bit more uh, open. Um, and I, and I wonder if it would work in the financial system as well, or, or if, or if the, the instincts of, uh, of governors, uh, to, to want to control this, uh, are, 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 are too much at odds with that. You know, part of the challenge, I think in this space is that you kind of had the, the app and the technology happen at the same time. You know, so, so it, 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 but at the same time, like we are moving to a place where you can divorce those two things, but a lot of people don't really understand that yet. Still, still don't really get, you know, that, um, I remember when I started at the forum, you know, in 2018 Davos, I started 2017 in 2018 Davos, my entire soundbite was like Bitcoin and blockchain, not the same thing, Bitcoin and blockchain, not the same thing, like over and over and over again, parroting it, right? Cause it was no one, people didn't understand that. Yeah. And so we've moved past that, but there's still this, there's still a general lack of understanding of the, of the distinction between the technical element and the financial systems element. And this is recreating something that has a tremendous amount of power and inertia behind it, right? You're going all the way back to kind of Bretton Woods and you think about creating a new financial order, a new financial system. The thing I think that's not, so there's a lot in there to unpack, but the thing I think that's not talked about a lot in the is how we thought about systemic risk. And so one thing that's really interesting, I think this is Dante's earlier point, is that we've kind of defined in the financial system systemic risk. We've just kind of like carved out a whole group of people and said, well, you know, yes, they're very vulnerable, but they're just outside of our system. Therefore, our system is really not all that risky or we can kind of allocate the risk in a way that kind of neutralizes a lot of it. And then this whole thing over here, we're going to ignore. And part of what I think the pandemic, at least I hope it has really highlighted is that no system, there is no outsider to the system. You have to look at the entirety of the system and you have to accommodate and count for that systemic risk, that risk that is coming from outside of what you think of as your closed yeah. system. 
So I actually think the internet early days did a very good job without necessarily making this a highlight, but thinking about that and being very open to a model that would accommodate more holistic notions of, of systemic risk. And that's something I don't think we talk about enough in our sector. We, we all think about it without maybe implicitly or otherwise. We don't really talk about it as much. Mm -hmm. So I started doing a lot more thinking about the early days of the internet and how risk was accommodated and how we could think about that in the new financial system yeah. that we're all interested in seeing be built or in your cases, actually literally building. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, and, and the key is optionality, right? So, so I, if, I um, and I, as it happens, risk is my cup of tea. I, I serve on FEMA's National Advisory Council, lose sleep over risk every day, all the time. And when you think about it, the one area of literally the entire global economy that performed well in the middle of a pandemic, the pandemic that sent the entire world on a work from home excursion, those so fortunate to have the ability to work from home, um, and, and it withstood the, the, the load, right? It withstood the load of, of entire economies being permanently um, uh, working from home. And that kind of bandwidth capability and that um, resilience, inherent resilience in the design, our financial systems don't enjoy that, right? So when, when the federal government had to respond to this crisis with an all about $5.5 trillion of, of uh, intervention to save the economy, effectively an example of privatizing gain and socializing losses, the very type of pattern we saw in 2008, totally. it then begs very, very deep questions about whether or not things like financial inclusion are basic human rights. And, and simply put, whether or not ubiquitous near universal access to the internet should be simply a part of the digital commons that we all enjoy. If yeah. we're all gonna depend on it in the middle of a fire drill, yeah. which is the COVID-19 yeah. event, um, then we should also ensure that on those rails could ride the transfer of value, the transfer of information, the transfer of assets, the transfer of title, identity, assurance, authentication, you name it. Today, none of those things are possible at scale. And it's an indictment of us as a planet and as a modern economy, I'm speaking now of the United States, that in order to exercise your civic duty and go vote, you have to go violate uh, uh, um, you know, social distancing requirements and wait in a physical line to exercise your civic duty. That should be something that motivates all of us, whether it's blockchain or some other standard, to make sure that the, the very core principles of functioning in a modern system and in a modern economy can leverage technology as a difference maker. And for all the areas that broke very rapidly with the onset of the pandemic, yeah. value, identity, voting, these types of basic civic engagements yeah. um, could yeah. use a little bit of digitization. Yeah. I, I love I love your thinking there, Dante. Uh, right on. <laughs> I, I think... Uh, uh, you know, I, I think what's interesting is, is, you know, there's this sort of top down view, like, you know, should, should, should the national government have, uh, you know, in China, there's like a, you know, blockchain is a major national initiative. It's got, you know, sponsorship every up and down the chain. It's, you know, no pun intended. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a big thing. There's nothing like that going on, you know, in most Western countries, certainly in the United States, uh, which I think is unfortunate, but, but there is a lot of bottom up innovation happening, right? There are so many interesting engineers, startups, projects, some sponsored by big tech companies like, like Facebook, but lots of them that are open source, that are building the plumbing for a, a public infrastructure where you can do secure identity um, and that, you know, nation states could even depend on for voting. And so there is so much that is there, and I, I feel like the the collective commons of, of of intellectual property creation that the internet has is working, and it may not work on the speed that that we want. And I think what what we're seeing out of China a little bit is you know leveraging that IP commons and all the energy around it with a big boost of of industrial policy as well. And so I, I think that that could be you know you know part of the answer. Well, and, and I'm sure all of us are. Sorry, Sheila. Um, <laughs> That's the only time, and I won't do it again, I promise. <laughs> you know, I'm sure we're Believe all tracking. Believe it <laughs> Right? We're all tracking with great interest. You know, the, the, the way Chris Giancarlo, um, you know, likens this as a digital space race, sort of an equivalent. I, I'm not in the vein of a zero-sum kind of person. I, I don't think we have to win at anybody's expense. And I think any one of these projects would benefit enormously from a very vibrant and innovative, thriving private sector. And what you see here, and this is why, again, I'm back to the great work that the Digital Currency Governance Consortium is trying to do, and the WEF is such a uniquely placed entity to build those bridges, is that 
you do want, and I think all of us would want to have the public sector have oversight over monetary policy and the creation of money. If a stable coin is nothing better than uh, sort of, uh, if imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, then a good US dollar backed stable coin is trying to mirror the underlying economic soundness and preconditions of the US dollar. But the, the creation of the dollar and the management of public policy and monetary sovereignty is a public sector activity. But the rails on how that type of value are delivered should and ought to include anything from a SWIFT transfer to an ACH to an EFT to an, op, you know, an option based on blockchain and stable coins. It's a, it's a better, more resilient system than one that is only riding on one or two cylinders from, from an economic value point of view. So it's not zero sum. I, I want you, you to succeed and I want everybody else in this sector to have a, a, a chance at success. Right now, that success is being hindered by a lot of red tape, yeah. a lot of fear and a lot of apprehension in the public sector um, that these types of risks or projects become systemic or they destabilize the system. And a lot of that sort of early branding problem the space had is, is kind of lingering with all of us. But, um, but I think there's a new era here where, where we can get, get it right and also get to innovate at scale. Yeah. This, and yeah. this gets so, into the yeah. public-private dimension here, Sheila. I know yeah, that's yeah. That's fundamental to the, the web platform. Yeah, maybe you can talk a little bit about it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, everything we do is multi-stakeholder in its conception. So it's about bringing together public and private sector actors and the third sector as well to really think about civil society actors academics and others who are really focused, uh, possibly more narrowly, but experts in particular needs articulated by certain communities. I think another thing we try to do is think very hard about geographic diversity. So a lot of the conversation uh, needs to, and I know that both of you are good about this, but many are not, uh, think about where the innovation is really happening. And that's in part where the innovation is able to happen. There is less incentive in really established economies. There's more uh, fear, there's, there's less, um, there's more incumbent power, right? So a lot of the innovation is happening in uh, frontier economies or smaller economies, and we're learning a lot from what's happening there. So when I first started at the, at the forum, you know, it was really, uh, you know, I had to really make the case that, that we should be focusing not just on the sort of typical halls of power, but looking at, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the island nations, the ECCB, looking at what's ha what Cambodia was doing, looking at some of the work that's happening in Africa, like all over the continent, by the way, yeah. right? Not just in Kenya, not just in what, what they were doing, kind of coming down in a draconian sure. manner or Ghana or Nigeria, but really looking across some of these economies to see what are the opportunities that we may be in, in a, with a Western mindset blind to and bringing those communities together. So our CBDC project actually started off with a goal. A, a, the only goal was community building. It was to say, we know which banks are talking to each other and which aren't. It's a huge miss. And we have the convening power and ability to say, you need to listen to these guys over here or these people over here uh, and do some education about what is actually possible with this technology. Uh, and in that case, it was, it was really starting off with a focus on blockchain, but then moving into an examination more of CBDC offering. Now, to the point about the kind of one ring to rule them all, you know, we are fervently opposed to that, that view. I don't think it makes any sense. It doesn't make any sense, strictly from a standpoint, if you even thought about it, if there was one CBDC, one stable coin, you know, and one crypto, there'd still be three, you know, so and they have very different needs. But it just doesn't make any sense because as you note, Dante, depending on what you kind of choose to put in your basket or what you choose to be backed by, you're, you're basically adopting to some extent a certain set of values. You know, and I think that we have to be very mindful of what those values are, not just from a from a literal economic power, you know, kind of really from a signaling perspective as well. I think that's also really important. And so while I, I agree with you, you know, that it's it's really important to think about uh, stability, particularly in the environment that we're in now, now more than maybe ever, as we're getting <laughs> economic fissures and, and challenges that we haven't really seen before, um, well, at least, you know, in our lifetime. Uh, I think that it's really important to think about that as well and to think about, you know, one thing we're interested in doing is thinking about almost like ethnographic type studies of money, right? Mm -hmm. And how the cultural values around money translate into policy and how making that more visible can mm -hmm. enable us to kind of almost cherry pick some of those values and norms and put them into other issuances without having to adopt an unstable currency. So there are things like this, I think, are really um, going to be quite fruitful and interesting to explore. Very much. I, you know, it, it makes me think about, and, and, and I know this is a, a, a key consideration with, with Libra as well, which is like, 
it's very easy to get caught up in the like, what does the G7 think? And, you know, what's, you know, what's the Fed or the ECB or whatever. And then, you know, you know it's big deal, the FSB and the G20, and they're going to have global stablecoin, you know, regulatory frameworks. And I think that's all very positive. We're all, you know, involved and contributing and, and that, that like sets a standard. But like the G20 is not the world. <laughs> the G20 is the G20. And, you know, when you think about the benefits of this technology, they go way outside the G20. And what are we really accomplishing? Are we, are we, are we building a new international, uh, you know, an internet of money that is truly global, that is, you know, the, the benefits and, and the frameworks, uh, you know, can be taken advantage of by everyone everywhere? Or are we, you know, trying to stovepipe and recreate uh, the rule set that sort of runs the the, the current monetary system that's largely dominated by the, the biggest economies. And, you know, what is the balance there? How do we ensure that, you know, in particular innovations like global stable coins where they have the reach of the internet and, you know, you know, people can participate in, in different ways, you know, how do we ensure that, that that happens that we don't just make this a, you know, a club of the G20. Well, well, so Jeremy, I mean, you hit the nail on the head, right? That if, to me, candidly, I think a lot of these innovations won't be as meaningful as they could be if all we do is replicate the existing system, right? And, and if you were born, and, and candidly, the existing system has more to do with your, the zip code or the country you were born in mm -hmm. than anything else. And even domestically, uh, a payment across two banking platforms that are not conversant introduces death by a thousand cut fees and, and we're laboring under slow, analog, painful, examples. I mean, ask the millions of Americans that were waiting for an analog check to arrive, yeah. um, you know, who were already living check to check. 40% uh, of the country can't survive a four or $500 setback. So, so I think we, we would fail in the effort if the effort didn't absolutely extend, or at least from a technological point of view, remove the cost and the barriers of extending the, the perimeter of the formal economy to the billions who are on the margin of it, um, otherwise, it's not real long-term value added. I mean, we have to figure out how to lay down infrastructure, not unlike the internet. Um, that pre-internet, it would have been very hard to provide for connectivity that was decoupled from fixed line infrastructure or from physical infrastructure, all back to the country of birth and the zip code. Um, here, the same challenges hold true for financial exclusion. Mm -hmm. um, and if we want to functionally extend the perimeter, we have to make a, a mobile device that's internet ready a regulated payment endpoint. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm absolutely like Sheila and, and others, completely technology agnostic as to how this is done. But what I'm uncompromising about is that it is done mm -hmm. uh, because the stakes are far too high and there are far too many people uh, on the margins for no good reason other than the, the thought of one brown person or, or a person in sub-Saharan Africa makes one errant payment, the entire continent must pay. Um, so we could do better than that as a planet. And, and I agree with you, we simply can't, you know, lobby across the Atlantic to get it right at one level, we have to figure out how to anchor this yeah. uh, in a multi-stakeholder yeah. environment. It's uh, you know, getting, uh, I think getting policymakers to think bigger, uh, you know, uh, think bigger about what this new, like a, a global digital economy, like really think bigger about what, what that can be, um, which I know both of you are doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which, which, is, which is awesome. Um, maybe, uh, maybe we can try and end on a, I hope an opt optimistic note, um, which is, you know, you know, there is this moment in time, there is this focus on global governance, there is technological innovation, there's all this stuff, you know, what do you think, what does this look like in two or three years? What does this look like in five years? I'd love to hear both of you, you know, share your thoughts on that. Sheila? Yeah, I, well, I think it's, it's quite different in two to three versus five. So in two to three, I think everyone is still, um, reacting to China, just putting it really bluntly. I think that that's going to really occupy the next uh, 18 months or so because we're, we're, it is human being nature to just kind of react, right? And, and if what we're going to, if what we expect to see coming out of China is what we actually do ultimately see, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, needed to some extent, but also uh, perhaps overblown response to that. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I think that will dissipate. I think that, you know, relatively quickly, I think people will kind of accommodate whatever they see and figure out exactly how to respond to it or carve out a new space or whatever it might look like. 
Uh, and then we'll shift into something that I really hope is truly more global and inclusive in nature. So at the five-year mark, to kind of focus more there, I think that we are, I think we are gonna see a, a lot more access by people who are not currently included in the formal economy uh, into the formal economy with on-ramps and off-ramps to tr more traditional systems. I don't think those are going to go away. I think to kind of Dante's earlier point, but I do think we're gonna see more entry and exit, you know, in and out of those systems where it is productive to be in those systems versus being adjacent to those systems but in a way that is um, complementary, you know, to those systems and accommodates the reality of those systems. Do I see a massive fight club type burn it all down, you know, Mr. Robot Revolution in money? I, I mean, I, gotta, I, I don't see that, certainly not in five years. And I don't even know that that is necessarily necessary. Um, however, I do hope that certain aspects of our current system that really don't serve anyone well, they serve very, very narrow set of players extremely well, and they really don't serve anybody else particularly well. I hope that we will be able to loosen uh, the stranglehold that certain actors have on our economic, uh, monetary and financial systems uh, and more equitably allocate the risk and reward as opposed to just reserving all the reward for a handful and, you know, blowing the risk uh, down to places where we like to pretend that we can, we can treat it as outside of our system or invisible to us. So that's my hope and I, I feel very optimistic about that in a five-year time frame. Awesome. Awesome. Well, look, for my part, for all, for all the doom and gloom and the talk of risk and resilience, I'm actually an eternal optimist. And, and I think between zero and three years from today, um, I think one will have made it clear that the, the, the stable coin and the digital currency movement had less to do with reinventing money and more to do with reinventing how people interact with the exchange of value, number one. And, and I think you'll start to see real big movement, um, for example, across key remittance corridors around the world that are stranded at the 7% global average, if not higher. You'll start to see very vigorous competition at the edge um, of trying to enable faster cross-border peer-to-peer payments. Um, and, and that to the extent that can happen in a three to five year run, I think it's a very, very meaningful contribution. Um, and then in the, in the three to five and then five onwards, um, I do think you'll start to see a lot of ubiquity uh, of this. I mean, th there is a movement afoot that is uh, that one, it's a generation different than our own, I presume, born with a instant gratification, born with trust in technology that is going to be much more willing to accept that value can also exist in a non-physical form and transferred in a non-physical form for everything as simple as paying a micro payment for liking a medium article or as complex as making a commercial transaction. I think the, the movement of money and the movement of value is what, what is being reinvented around these concepts that we've discussed today and much less so the, the reinvention of money itself. Um, and so I'm, I'm very optimistic that a lot of good will come uh, in, in the future. The money movement has legs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, this has been awesome, you guys. I really, really enjoy uh, enjoyed the conversation. A lot of you know, just you know, far-reaching stuff, and obviously looking forward to uh, you know continuing to to work with you guys and see see a lot of this stuff through over the next couple of years. So here, thank here. you. Same, yeah. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank, thank you, for you for thanks for joining yeah, today. Thanks. Thanks. So, uh, final reflections. Um, I, I, I just I would say it's just amazing, you know, that we've come this far. Uh, I think we're really seeing the birth of a fundamental new infrastructure for the global economy. Really believe strongly that these multi-stakeholder outcomes, where governance uh, that involves the technology community, the government community. Uh, intellectual leaders, uh, financial industry stakeholders, that's what it's going to take uh, to bring this uh, to scale and to the mainstream. And, and I think, as you may have heard today, we are on our way there. Um, that leads us a little bit um, into uh, next week's episode, uh, you know, digital dollars and global stable coins, you know, crypto and blockchain in general are really coming into focus more and more with policymakers globally. Uh, it's an, a much more intense focus at the supranational level and at the national level, as we talked about, you know, in China, you know, blockchain is a national strategic priority. Uh, and in DC, policymakers are starting to engage. 
Uh, so we're going to be exploring digital currency in DC next week, and we'll have several, I think, excellent guests who are playing key roles in interfacing with the policymaking community and the regulatory community in DC and, and hear from them uh, from the front lines of, of digital currency policy in DC. So uh, looking forward to that uh, episode next week. And until next time, stay well, stay safe and stay informed. Thank you. Thank you.